Awesome. So there's me thinking of making my ring out of metallic uranium, which is actually going to be incredibly difficult and one of the most challenging things ever. Uh, but, you know, down coming down to the comments, uh, someone makes a comment about aqueous urinal salts are highly transdermal. You aren't even wearing gloves. And he's right. I'm not. And there's a few reasons for that. I mean, the first one is this is, this is dissolved in concentrated nitric acid. You will be screaming in agony long before any of that uranium has gotten even even thought about going through your skin. Um, but there is actually a valid point here that you've got to be aware of your hazards always uh, in chemistry, probably much more so in biochemistry and in things like biology, where things can live and grow and reproduce on their own, like uh, uh, viruses. <coughs> Just saying. Um so there is actually something that's kind of fun. Not fun. There is something that is reassuring about dealing with chemicals and radiation in that you know exactly what you've got there on the lab, in the lab and how dangerous it is. Or at least you should know. And for me, when it's dissolved in uranium, when it's dissolved in nitric acid, uh it's safe your your main hazard there is you're just going to burn yourself with the nitric acid now it's got to be said at this point that uh, i'm not exactly green to this game i've been doing chemistry analytical chemistry uh that sort of thing for you know a couple of decades and with that uh, just through doing lots of it eventually you kind of don't make as many mistakes and if you don't make as many mistakes, um, the, the, the cost-benefit analysis of wearing gloves shift. Um, it, it's contingent on what things you're dealing with. Uh, for me, if I'm dealing with something which dissolves very quickly in the fat of the skin, you know, things like pyrenes, things that are very carcinogenic, yeah, absolutely, you wear gloves. Um it just, just, just makes sense that way. With things like uranium, eh, uh, lesser, uh, true, but to a lesser extent. Um, so, if you come to take a look at uh, how transdermal are uranium salts, uh, it can be shown to penetrate the skin within 15 minutes of application. So, basically, you need to have them sat on your skin. And you need a lot, I mean, you basically got to smear this stuff on your skin, which is never going to happen, uh, even less so when it's in a solution of nitric acid. Uh, and then when you get onto things like uranium dioxide, uranium dioxide is essentially a rock. Uh, dust, there is zero chance of that going through your skin. Uh, there, your hazards are more, it's radioactive, but by far your biggest hazard with things like uranium dioxide, it's nothing to do with the toxicity of uranium. It's nothing to do with the radioactivity of uranium. It's the fact that it's a fine dust and even sand, silica. If you get the right size particles, can be really quite nasty if you get it in your lungs, which is why when I was handling this as a powder, eh, I gave it quite a lot of respect. Um, so if you get really small particles, they go into your lungs and you just breathe them out again. They don't really have a chance to settle out. And if they're too big, they become stuck on your uh, your upper respiratory tract and they just get sort of spat out as mucus or swallowed or something like that. Uh, it's only if they're just the wrong sized particle, uh, which will go into your lungs and stick deep in your lungs that you can have a problem there it kind of messes up your respiratory system and they can actually go through and uh it cause problems with your kidneys as well so like that you know fine powders can be tricky and be careful with fine powders 
which is why when I was handling my uranium, I showed a lot of respect once it got to the fine powder level. Um, but even at that, if you take a look at the toxicity of uranium salts, these are things that, you know, when they're dissolving you, how toxic is it? These are sort of comparable toxicities to cyanide, but uh, not as acute. This will take a long time to cause its damage. Uh, but even at that, 150 milligrams, this is sort of standard heavy metal toxicity. It's about an aspirin-sized tablet. Uh, that's an awful lot to try and get through your skin. And, yeah, okay, kidney failure. I mean, you compare this to, say, for instance, mercury. Uh, mercury, they're talking toxic levels of 0.1 milligrams per litre. People are about 100 litres-ish. So you're talking about 10 milligrams. So mercury is almost an order of magnitude nastier than uranium. And this this is just the chemical toxicity, by the way. The... the, the um, Radiation hazard for uranium, whilst the uranium that I made went up to 500 times background, uh, it sounds bad, but it's alphas, it's outside of the body. Once you get more than a few centimeters away, you get almost no exposure. But just to really highlight the point, uh, a friend of mine was growing some plants. And I'm doing a time lapse of them. So I thought, great, I'll put my uranium dioxide in there which is 500 times background and we'll see what effect that has on his plants growing and the answer was almost none well none that you none that you can actually see which is maybe not entirely unsurprising when i first went looking for some uranium ore i the uranium tailings that i found were about 100 times background 150 times background that sort of thing and there were plants growing in there uh, there was no obvious uh, problem that the plants had with growing in that sort of level of, of radioactivity. I will at some point get around to doing a much nicer time lapse with plants growing directly through hopefully some uranium oxide powder uh, just to see how much effect that actually has on yeah, the growth of these things. Anyway, so uh, if it comes down to things like toxicity, I would worry far more about things like mercury than I would about uranium, which might seem like a bit of a bizarre tangent, but really it's not because uh, I've actually tried already to dissolve some of my uranium oxide into something like molten zinc chloride and electrolyze it. Dismal failure. Uh, I've got some very nice video of it, but it's all crash and burn type stuff. However, uh, there are literature methods for getting some fairly nice uranium on small scale. The, the classical way of getting uranium out of uranium uh, oxide is you essentially do a thermite type reaction. This is the way that they've done it uh, on large scales forever. Uh, and uranium is fairly available, fairly cheap metal. It's 50 odd dollars per kilogram if you look at the, the, the trading prices, which is you know, a thousand times cheaper than a kilo of gold. Um, but anyway, so I needed the method, uh, not the traditional method, because I only want to clean up a couple of grams of metallic uranium to make my ring out of. And this method seems pretty decent. Uh, it basically entails shaking a uh, uh, uranium s solution. So again, this is where the guy with his concerns about the the, the transdermal nature of uranium salts uh, would maybe have a point. But the concentration they're using here, you'd have to like, you'd have to basically bathe in the stuff and sit in this sort of concentration for an extended period of time to get the stuff to go through your skin. Uh, or, you know, to get 100 milligrams to go through your skin. Uh, if I was just to you know, try and do some math in my head here. Uh, let's say uranium's got a molecular weight of 100. So that would be... 
600 milligrams per litre, I think. So you would have to absorb the uranium from a um, few hundred milliliters of solution to, to have a problem. Anyway, so you get your uranium solution, you mix it up with mercury amalgam, that's mercury sodium amalgam, and then, of course, you've got to distill off the mercury, which is by far the most dangerous part of all of this. Oh, it turns out I've actually got a kilo of mercury, uh, for which I've had for some time. It's ugly as sin. It needs distilling, which is why, yeah, mercury, uh, if you get exposed to significant amounts of mercury, it can be quite nasty. But when I'm doing the distillation of this, it's going to be entirely enclosed in an all-glass apparatus, distilled under vacuum. There, There is limited uh, potential for being exposed to the mercury vapor like this. Anyway, so that's the grand uh, plan here for making the metallic uh, uranium. First thing I'm going to do is distill mercury, because like I was saying at the moment, it doesn't look pretty. So that is why frequently you don't see me wearing gloves when I'm working, even with some fairly dangerous stuff. I prefer the dexterity of working with your hands versus, okay, you get some protection from having the gloves on. It, it depends on the compounds you're dealing with. With things like this, it really doesn't matter. For things like sodium or potassium, I know there are lots of, um, chemistry teachers I've come across, uh, they just don't understand me handling things like sodium and potassium with my bare hands. Because don't you have, well, why don't you wear gloves? And the simple answer is gloves, if sodium and potassium alloy gets wet, gloves offer basically zero protection because the temperature goes up to like 400 degrees Celsius in almost an instant. It'll burn through gloves like they're nothing. And other than that, you you know when your fingers are wet. You don't, if you've got gloves on, you don't know if your fingers are wet. And like that, I actually prefer, yeah, you, you get better sensory feedback. That's the main reason, okay, and combined with the hazard that, you know, you're dealing with, why um, I don't end up wearing gloves uh, when this is what it looks like the next. with these uranium solutions. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, drop a like on the video, and I'll see you next time.